Alrighty guys, what's going on? Linky here, and in today's video, we are gonna be looking at Pokemon's legacy on the Nintendo Switch so far. We've gotten a handful of Pokemon mainline and spin-off titles on the Nintendo Switch since it was first revealed and then put out in 2017. And now we're in the year 2022. We are seemingly, you know, pretty much halfway through. Most people think the Nintendo Switch's lifespan. So let's take a look at Pokemon's impact on the console so far and try to predict where it's going moving forward. Now the history of Pokemon on the Nintendo Switch is actually really interesting. When the console was first announced, reporters asked Game Freak about it, the Pokemon company about it, will you guys have a presence on the Switch? This was because the Switch was seemingly a combination of Nintendo's handheld and home systems. It was gonna be one system. There was no longer going to be a successor to the Nintendo 3DS and a successor to the Wii U. The successor was one and the same. And I think five years in to the Nintendo Switch's life cycle, it's a little difficult to look back on this time without the rose colored glasses of everything that's transpired since. But there was a lot of doubt and a lot of confusion within the industry and among fans of how this would work. Could Nintendo really combine both of these hardware systems into one and make one mainline handheld and home console. Now, of course, we know with the blessing of history that this has worked and it succeeded for Nintendo and it's a pretty good decision, but at the time, it wasn't totally sure. And the Pokemon company wasn't completely committal on if they would develop games for the system at first. That could have just been something to say to the public so that they could, you know, not play their hand right at the start, but eventually we did get reveals and releases of games and it started with spin-off titles. We got things like Pokémon Tournament DX, Pokémon Super Mystery Dungeon, or now Pokémon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX, remakes and ports of older handheld and console games for the Nintendo Switch. We've gotten a bevy of spin-offs on the Nintendo Switch since it first came out. The ones that I've just mentioned and others like new Pokemon Snap, Pokemon Home, and other things that aren't just games but are software entities for the console itself. We've gotten stranger additions like Pokemon games that not only work on the Switch itself but also work on phones and tablets. Pokemon Unite is one of the more recent additions to that list. There's been a lot of interesting spin-offs that have come. And it's one of the things that I think we're going to look back on and appreciate about this era of Pokemon and that spinoffs are fully here. There was a bit of a lull after Generation 4. Generation 4 for a lot of people seemed to be the height of spinoff Pokemon titles with titles like Ranger and Mystery Dungeon and Nobunaga's Ambition getting a Pokemon reskin. A lot of these things, uh, other, other apps on the Wii like Poke Park and My Pokemon Ranch, Pokemon Battle Revolution. It was a golden era for spin-offs. The first Pokemon game on the Nintendo DS wasn't actually a mainline game. It wasn't Diamond and Pearl, it was Pokemon Dash. There was a bit of a lull after that. Generation 5, Generation 6 didn't have a ton of spin-offs. There were, of course, more Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games and things of that like, but it was a lot less than it was during Generation 4. Pokemon has supported these spin-offs on the Switch, and I think it's been one of the major successes for Pokemon on the Nintendo Switch. What about those mainline games, though? How has it been since the console's release? Now, before we go any further, I just wanted to mention that the vast majority of you guys who are watching these videos and hopefully enjoying them aren't subscribed to the channel. Now, of course, subscribing is free and you can unsubscribe anytime. And if you do subscribe, be sure to turn that notification bell on so you never miss another upload. And if you want to check out the join tab below, check out some of the perks and see if you want to support this channel by going the extra mile. With that being said, let's get right back to the video. Mainline Pokemon is an interesting term in and of itself because it's one that Pokemon fans love to argue about constantly. When Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee were announced and revealed for the Nintendo Switch, you've got to understand the context at which they were announced. Before these games came out, there were wild rumors circulating around the community that Pokemon Stars was the next game and the first game to come out on the Switch, a remake or an HD version of Sun and Moon or Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, something that would take all of those things and bring it to the Switch. 
That was the hot rumor, and of course that didn't happen. There were also quieter rumors that Pokemon Diamond and Pearl remakes were going to be the first thing on the Switch, and that's pretty much normal. Ever since Oras came out, there have been rumors and quote-unquote leaks about Diamond and Pearl remakes, and eventually we got them, but that wasn't first. It was Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, a amalgamation of Pokemon Go and Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow specifically, uh, brought Kanto into HD and introduced brand new catching mechanics and a lack of wild battles in a Pokemon game for the first time. Fans debated and argued if it was mainline or if it was spin-off, and let's be perfectly clear, it doesn't matter at all to anybody. In my opinion, the way that I draw the line is that if a Pokemon can be transferred from the game into other games, then it's mainline. That's why I consider Pokemon Ranger games to be mainline. Pokemon Battle Revolution, I consider to be part of the mainline world. Pokemon Coliseum and XD Gale of Darkness, I consider to be taking place in the same mainline world. Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee are part of that. They are, of course, in a different universe. You know, we've we've done a lot about the multiverse with Pokemon in recent generations, and it falls into line there. And these games were, you know, decently received by people. I think they have their detractors, but they also have plenty of people who loved them for the new mechanics, loved them for the ease of catching shiny Pokemon and just shaking it up. But it wasn't what we were looking for from the new generation. That was 2018. The following year, we got our brand new generation in Pokemon Sword and Shield, and I will gloss over as much of the controversy as humanly possible because that was quite possibly the most toxic year to be a Pokemon fan that we will ever experience. I'm not going to comment on the validity of the variety of criticisms that people laid towards these games. There are plenty of people who enjoyed Pokemon Sword and Shield, like myself, who also had criticisms of it. But there were also a lot of people, in my personal opinion, who were never going to game, give the games a chance and did not want to see any positives in them because of the negatives that they saw. And I don't think that's the way you should approach anything that you're a fan of. You don't need to be overly critical to claim some sort of moral superiority when talking about things you appreciate. You can appreciate things and still recognize their flaws. That's perfectly okay. That generation, in hindsight, was Game Freak experimenting a lot with the Switch and experimenting with what mainline Pokemon looks like on a modern console. We got DLC the following year, and that was a first for the Pokemon franchise, and I think the DLC was probably the most warmly received piece of the entire Generation 8, uh, you know, existence, genuinely. It was the most enjoyed thing about Sword and Shield. It got the most praise. It did interesting, new, intuitive things with the Pokemon formula and brought the open world concept into Pokemon uh, more fruitfully than the mainline games did or the core versions of the games did. And that was a good year. And it was interesting because we had a break from main Pokemon games for a year, which has not happened since. 2020, that's where things kind of went wild. That was, of course, the DLC year. And, you know, I think with everything going on in the world, it was a nice respite to kind of not have to deal with the hype cycle of brand new Pokemon games. But that changed very quickly in 2021. We got BDSP and we got Legends Arceus. Legends Arceus is where the argument and the rearing of the is it mainline, is it not mainline came about again. Guys, Legends Arceus is mainline. BDSP is mainline. There's not much of a debate here. These are these are Pokemon games set in the same world. These are Pokemon games set just further back in the timeline. They're mainline. We got two games in the span of a year, and we're getting two games this year because Legends came out this year instead of last, even though most of the hype cycle was last year. It was an interesting time to be a Pokemon fan because we got two mainline games in the span of three months and their release cycles followed each other. It was very weird and a lot of fans were like, okay, why is this? Why are we getting two games so close to one another? And you know, Legend Arceus was very warmly received. People love it. It is a lot of people's favorite Pokemon game in at least in the modern era and BDSP is it was controversial like Sword and Shield, maybe a little bit less because people knew Legends Arceus was coming, but there were still its detractors. So it's worth noting that the Switch era has had a lot of controversy for Pokemon. Now we're at the future. Scarlet and Violet are coming, and it looks to be a marriage between mainline classic Pokemon formulas and the open world exploration that was introduced in Legends Arceus. History will eventually determine if this is successful. 
is Scarlet and Violet going to come out with less controversy than Sword and Shield? Will Generation 9 be a more exciting time for Pokemon fans than Generation 8 was? Because Generation 8 was grating. Will it change how Pokemon is perceived on the Switch? Sword and Shield are the best-selling Pokemon games on the Nintendo Switch. I believe they're either the second or third best-selling sets of Pokemon games ever. So the overall crowd ate it up even if Pokemon fans to their core didn't love the experience as much as previous games. Will Scarlet and Violet change any of this? It'll be interesting to see. And when we come back to this, this topic, once the Switch life is over, how will Scarlet and Violet change the mold? I think Pokemon on the Nintendo Switch can broadly be defined as its most controversial era, but also its most inventive era. There are so many different art styles that we've seen from these games, so many spin-offs, and Game Freak genuinely taking risks, even if a lot of fans don't think they are. Will this bear better fruit in the future? Or will it be seen as the Black Sheep era of the Pokemon franchise and take that mantle from Generation 5 on the end of the DS's life cycle? It'll be interesting to see. I would love to know what you guys think about Pokemon's time on the Switch down below. Have you enjoyed it? Have you enjoyed this era of Pokemon? Do you think it's better or worse than previous ones? And what have been some of the standout highlights for you? Let me know down in the comments section below. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Make sure you turn that notification bell on so you never miss another video. And I will talk to you guys next time. Peace out.